Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, the regulatory landscape, and capital markets. This segment is presented by Charles Schwab. I'm your host, Jill Alandrino, and joining us this afternoon, we have Sergey Nazarov, co-founder of Chainlink, the industry standard Oracle platform, as well as Stanley Kolikov, founder of Ave Labs and Ave's institutional platform known as Horizon. We're here to discuss how decentralized finance and traditional markets are converging through on-chain infrastructure and tokenization. Of course, look forward to seeing the both of you on November 4th and 5th at SmartCon by Chainlink, the premier conference for leaders across finance, Web3, and government to explore the convergence of traditional finance and the on-chain world. NASDAQ Trade Talks will be there broadcasting as we do each year, live from the event meeting with top thought leaders at the conference. It's great to see the both of you, as always. Stani, let's kick it off as you, with you. You've said that DeFi will become the foundation of global finance, and that's a bold claim. Why do you believe that? And how do you see on-chain infrastructure reshaping global capital markets over the next decade? Thanks, Jill. And I think kind of uh, if you look at the history of, of DeFi, a lot of this infrastructure was built on an open system. So um, what we're seeing is that any type of uh, uh, innovation can be created on a uh, network uh, such as uh, Ethereum, whether that's uh, essentially a, a lending uh, infrastructure or trading uh, infrastructure or uh, tokenized assets. And what we noticed uh, over the years is that with the principles of uh, decentralized finance, such as uh, being able to guarantee execution based on smart contracts, um, being able to provide full transparency on uh, the execution and to end uh, giving the market participants a uh, direct overview of the, the whole system um, the liquidity provides these benefits where uh, by using decentralized finance, um, we're able to uh, operate with uh, financial, uh, operate in a financial context where we actually rely less on human involvement and rely more on smart contracts and open networks where the costs are going down and the, the whole network and these applications that are built um, on Ethereum in, in DeFi are completely verifiable for every uh, participant. So based on that um, and looking at the track record of decentralized finance uh, so far, Aave has been able to attract uh, 75 uh, billion worth of uh, deposits uh, at the moment um, and being able to operate over five years period without any kind of uh, interception, downtime, uh, risk fully auditable and a programmable uh, infrastructure, it showcases how actually resilient uh, decentralized finance is. Now, what we're doing now is, is simply um, looking into DeFi and, and all the infrastructure that we've been able to build uh, and using these digital uh, native digital assets, we're using the same infrastructure to more traditional assets with uh, servicing tokenized assets. So what we believe is that one of the next uh, steps for decentralized finance is actually not just serve these um, uh, digital uh, blockchain native digital assets, but also traditional assets that are coming uh, on chain and providing 24 seven uh, liquidity also outside of the uh, trading hours. Sergey, what's driving the increased convergence between DeFi and traditional finance and how do you see that accelerating as institutional adoption grows? I think the shift in regulation, especially by the U.S., has had a massive impact on the institutional view of DeFi and public chains in general. I think that that uh, regulatory shift is going to only speed up. So I think the institutional comfort level with public chains and therefore the DeFi applications on those public chains is going to also accelerate. DeFi has historically created very attractive yields. And it has now done it very reliably, as Stani described it with Aave, for fi over five years. And so now DeFi has a reliability track record. It's reliably providing high quality yield, higher yield than other parts of the traditional financial system. That's definitely attractive. That yield is higher on the U.S. dollar inside of Stani's application Aave than it is from the best sources of TradFi yield on the U.S. dollar. So I think the institutional world's starting to realize that. And then um, when you look at 
what the institutions could use before on public chains and what they could use before from DeFi, it was a very limited menu. It was almost nothing. And so Stani and uh, Ave Horizon are really, I think, reinventing and uh, blazing the, the, the way for what a compliant, highly reliable DeFi application looks like for institutions. You know, we're really thrilled to be working with uh, him and his team, which we work with for the entire life of, of Ave and we're, we're thrilled to be a part of their community and to help them build and secure Ave as a, as a, as a friend and partner. And I can tell you from our work with the institutions out there like JP Morgan, UBS, DBS, Swift, DTCC, and others that you know they're very interested in exactly the type of problems that Ave Horizon is solving. And it's because Ave Horizon is um, is solving these compliance and usage problems that have historically been unsolved in DeFi. So I think you know a good regulatory landscape, attractive economics in the form of higher yields on traditional assets, and now a good application that institutions can use in a compliant, reliable manner in the form of Ave Horizon. I think all all, all of those three factors are are going to be big uh, big forces driving institutional adoption. Yeah, and Stani, I have it noted here that Horizon's early growth, it has an impressive over $200 million in just six weeks. So that's clearly a signal that institutions are jumping in here. What do you think is driving the shift and why are financial institutions turning to DeFi now and how are they actually using it? I think one of the biggest uh, biggest drivers for um, the Horizon ad adoption, there's there's two, two parts of it. So one is that DeFi has been able to mat mature as a technology and, and proven its uh, capabilities on what it could actually do on the kind of like a more native digital asset space. Now, in more recently, what we've seen is that more and more institutions are actually becoming more comfortable um, with using the blockchain and in and, and this current regulatory uh, climate, as Sergey mentioned, there's, there's more appetite to actually move from uh, exploration to execution. Now, when it comes to execution, a lot of these uh, financial institutions, they are actually looking on once you've tokenized assets and uh, brought value onto the blockchain, what will be the next um, use case for these assets? And typically uh, lending and borrowing and being able to um, Used, uh, use these uh, traditional assets as a collateral and borrowing against them is a really big use case and, and the whole concept of uh, collateral management. Now, obviously this will not be possible without the previous track record in, in, in decentralized finance, what Aave and Chainlink has done and also the work that Chainlink has done by introducing price feeds and an accurate way of pricing these traditional assets uh, that has their own types of... Uh, um, uh, peculiar uh, features. And what we've seen is that um, now as more and more institutions are coming, um, more decentralized finance is, is going to have demand. And one of the biggest benefits that we've seen uh, for these traditional institutions is that they're able to operate uh, in a much more programmatic um, uh, interfaces and, and they have more transparency and also oversight on the risk controls uh, because decentralized finance operates on uh, uh, permissionless and, and public blockchains while um, being able to operate in a compliant uh, manner. And Horizon is a great example where actually the asset issuers, uh, they can uh, distribute their assets directly to their users with their own uh, compliance and risk frameworks but once you pass that compliance and risk framework, you can then uh, use your assets uh, in uh, Aave's uh, horizon market and, and borrow uh, against. So in, in some ways uh, we can say that uh, DeFi has matured uh, to a point where it's actually uh, feasible for traditional finance to start moving more into execution. So Sergey, help us understand how Aave and Chainlink are partnering to unlock value across DeFi and what lessons from that success could apply to traditional financial infrastructure. Sure. So, so Chainlink has been a, a part of Aave from launch. So together, together with the Aave team, we were providing them, as Stani clearly said, the, the price data initially. 
And then since then, the Chainlink platform has evolved to provide cross-chain. And in the case of Aave Horizon, we're also looking and working on providing some of those compliance tools, which also require oracles. Um, I think the way to look at DeFi and, and Aave is that Aave has a great governance model, a great community, a great collection of highly reliable contracts, a great collection of risk managers and very thoughtful folks thinking about making sure the protocol is stable and reliable, which has been for over five years and you know why, why it has over 75 billion inside of it. Chainlink provides certain key IT building blocks called oracles, price oracles, bridging oracles, identity oracles, compliance oracles, which um, if you were to think of Aave as like a bank, Chainlink would be kind of like the IT department of the bank, making sure that certain key systems are operating correctly. And so when you think about banks, you know, they are both a collection of really smart financial professionals building high quality financial products and the IT systems that power those products, right? And that's really what um, DeFi is and what Aave and Chainlink have, have been partnering on since, you know, the, the, the beginning. I think the way this applies to traditional finance is that you have these separate building blocks now in DeFi, like you have a bunch of separate contracts and separate oracles, and then people can come and use those. And they can use those building blocks for their capital. They can integrate with them. I think traditional finance will really benefit from that model because to Stani's point, that model is very verifiable. So they can verify the integrity of the contracts, of the oracles, of how everything works. They can have all the details uh, about the system. And I think the traditional financial infrastructure world will see that as a superior model because right now the traditional financial infrastructure world is very closed and you don't know the risks or the problems that you'll face when you're dealing with a counterparty or what degree of control they have or don't have or what security they have or don't have. And it's one of the biggest questions when dealing with counterparties is how reliable is this counterparty? How secure is this counterparty? What level of control does the counterparty have over my assets? And so I think once traditional finance understands this new model of infrastructure, where you have a group of people making really reliable contracts and managing the risk around them, and then you have a group of people making all these IT building blocks, and they're all working together to make this modular system that you can have access to and verify the integrity of, I, I think that'll be a more attractive version, uh, both for the DeFi community, which it already is, and now for the TradFi community for, for those reasons. Yeah, certainly removing those silos for sure. Stani, stable coins and tokenized assets are laying the new foundation for a new kind of capital market. It's faster, it's programmable, it's global, it's 24-7. What does this unlock for investors and institutional asset managers? Yeah, stable coins is definitely a, a, a very key um, piece of an infrastructure in uh, both in DeFi and the world of uh, tokenized uh, assets. So Stable coins are, are the way to actually unlock uh, liquidity out of uh, tokenized assets with borrowing and, and lending. But at the same time, it allows uh, a lot of these uh, investors to get outside of the traditional um, trading hours um, and access liquidity outside of trading hours over the weekend and 24-7. Um, a typical example, what we see in currently in the tokenized asset space is the ability to redeem a lot of these fund shares uh, with stable coins outside of the trading hours. And that's just the, the, the beginning. But one key point to um, realize is that stable coins are the way to access uh, decentralized finance and the whole universe that is um, around smart contracts and um, on chain. And, and I think that is the, the, the really uh, key unlock point here. So it makes Stablecoins makes uh, the movements of uh, capital much more faster, programmable, um, finding opportunities that uh, exist across DeFi and the tokenization uh, space. In some ways, um, stablecoins provide uh, faster uh, and more transparent uh, fin financial rails around these uh, financial opportunities and, and financial assets. And Sergey, to wrap up here, as institutional tokenization continues to accelerate, what trends do you see shaping the next phase of blockchain adoption in the global markets? Stablecoin adoption will increase 
I think rapidly there will be much more stablecoin total value than there than there has been uh, so far. I think tokenization of funds, tokenization of various other real world assets like equities and others. So tokenization of more and more traditional financial things. And then you'll start to see the formation of markets around those tokenized um, traditional real world assets and the stable coins that are going to be used as payment to buy into those markets. And then finally, I think you'll see that rise in stable coins and that rise in real world assets eventually uh, really, really benefit the DeFi protocols that have made institutional versions of their system like Aave's Horizon, because once all of those things are on chain, I think they'll seek out the most reliable, widely used systems. And so I, I, I foresee a world where the stablecoin boom, the real world asset tokenization boom benefits, you know, both of those groups, the people who make stable coins and the people who tokenize real world assets. But then the final large beneficiary, I think, will be the protocols that operate on chain in an institutionally compatible way, uh, which is where I think Ave Horizon will have a very big role to play, just like Ave has had a very big role to pay, play in the DeFi ecosystem. And really for the same reasons of reliability and security and that, you know, it's the most reliable version of, of, that, of that thing, which, by the way, institutional finance tends to gravitate towards the, you know, liquidity begets liquidity. And, you know, the most reliable thing is the one they tend to go towards because they are very conservative about those types of risks. So I, I do see DeFi growing as a result of those other trends. Once the pathway for DeFi usage from a compliance point of view and a regulatory point of view becomes even more clear, which I think we're just on the cusp of that. And that's already happened in many cases. So it's a very exciting time. All right. It certainly is. Look forward to seeing the both of you November 4th and 5th at SmartCon by Chainlink in New York City. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. And thanks for joining me. I'm Jill Melandrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ. Thank you.